So I'm going to be speaking a, a bit today about um, technology in humanity. Um, you might be wondering why a Christian theologian would care about this in particular. Um, well, some of the history you've already heard, I have at least degrees in engineering. Um, what you might not know is I worked in the field of robotics and aerospace engineering in Los Angeles for the better part of seven to eight years working with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and others. It's probably my phone, I'll put that down there. Um, and when I first started kind of doing Christian theology, I didn't know you could do these things together. <laughs> And um, when I went to do my graduate work at Oxford, I read a book by George Pattison, uh, who would then become my doctoral supervisor called Thinking About God in an Age of Technology. And I thought, my goodness, I could bring these two different areas that I have have kind of been doing in parallel together and provide explicit reflection. So this talk is in some ways uh, part and parcel of one of the kind of research streams that um, I really preoccupy uh, myself with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, aside from, you know, thinking about the three persons of the Trinity, I think about how technology is impacting us today. Um, let me present you with a kind of brief scenario that happens all too often to me. I often give academic and public presentations uh, on the topic of human enhancement and post-humanism, much like I am right now. And during these kinds of presentations, I will talk about different human enhancement procedures and the different kind of technologies, perhaps even uh, some that might be based on AI. And we'll then claim that what is at stake in addressing the kind of implications of human enhancement is not exhausted by the direct, proximate ethical questions. Assessing, of course, the safety and protocols of new procedures and technologies that could be used for human enhancement are important. Of course, that's the case. But what is often sidelined in these discussions are the kind of long-term anthropological issues that they often raise. I often ask the audience, doesn't the very term enhancement presuppose we know where we want the human being to go or enhancing towards something? What is our goal in enhancement? In other words, we cannot treat the ethical issues without also addressing the inherent anthropological vision, ideology, the telos. And what I want to say is we find such an ideology telos in uh, an, uh, a group called uh, posthumanism or an ideology called posthumanism. Now, however, once I then outline the kind of various tenets, the goals, and even the different kinds of movements of posthumanism, I'm invariably posed a line of questions, as I'm sure many of you have, if not already thought about, probably thinking about now. Is it technically feasible for us to reach some kind of posthuman state? And what would be the conditions by which we would measure precisely um, whether we had actually met that state? How would we know when we reached it? Why would we even think we'll get beyond the human? In other words, is posthumanism a valid movement worthy of discussion beyond just the proximate ethical concerns of particular technologies? Will it really change the human being in such a radical way that we should actually consider it in our most sober moments? Well, in putting together this paper, I wondered how many here in the audience might be thinking this exact thing, and particularly in reference to the church, since I know we have a number of church leaders here tonight. Why are we talking about posthumanism and not just human enhancement? What makes this topic that priests, pastors, and laity alike, or even none, ought to consider? How is this an ecclesial matter? Well, there are many responses to this line of questioning. I could reference how posthumanism is gaining traction as an ideology amongst the broader populace, requiring church leaders to take explicit note. Or I could cite how the posthumanist ideology is present among people in positions of power and influence, which is true as well. Or I could talk about how the beliefs that typify posthumanism 
are found in less radical positions that we actually see all the time. They're ubiquitous. And then therefore we need to take them with real seriousness today. All of these are adequate enough for the church to take notice of the future of human becoming and the ideologies that are being crafted in response. But that niggling question is still there. If the post-human has not arrived yet, and there might even be some skepticism that it ever will, why are we talking about it with such sobriety in the context of the church? Why does it matter to the normal churchgoer in the pew? Well, I want to convince you in the rest of our time together why I think post-humanism is important for ecclesial leaders and laity, indeed people of all stripe. However, I'll push beyond the reasons I just cited, for I think there is a much more pressing reason why post-humanism is relevant to the church that is much closer to home. Indeed, I'll argue here that we actually take part in helping to usher in the post-human, often unreflectively, and that those in the church are not inoculated or free from it. Indeed, the post-human is not something far off in a possible future, but rather amongst us here today, and we are participating agents in its coalescence, not primarily in an assent to its beliefs, per se, but instead in the practices that lay the groundwork for its construction. So hopefully the uh, title of my talk is starting to get a little bit clearer. But how do we know when the post-human has arrived? How do we become post-human? Well, to begin, I want to challenge the image that you might have of how the post-human comes about. Perhaps even this picture is influencing your particular image of what that post-human might be. And usually the injure con uh, conjured is some humanoid figure outfitted with all kinds of advanced technologies perhaps fully integrated with super-intelligent artificial intelligence. It might be a bioengineered creature where its genomic material has not only been scrubbed of all kinds of wicked disorders, but perhaps it has been given greater strength, mental acuity, and physical stamina. But its design features do not end here. I'm sure you are picturing this post-human with the most cyborg-like computer hardware embedded in its skin. In some ways, I feel a bit like that today with all these lapels on. Or you might think that this post-human figure has no organic body and instead is merely a consciousness purely downloaded into silicon-based hardware or running as some virtual avatar on a computer. Yet, as uh, one notable um, uh, academic figure um, who's written extensively on post humans post has said, um, the technological retrofitting of the human misses the real Copernican shift to the post-human state. This is what N. Catherine Hales has said. In fact, she argues, we are already post-human. In her seminal book, how we became post-human, she says this. It is important to recognize that the construction of the post-human does not require the subject to be a literal cyborg. Whether or not interventions have been made on the body, new models of subjectivity emerging from such fields as cognitive science and artificial life imply that even a biologically unaltered Homo sapien counts as post-human. The defining characteristics involve the construction of subjectivity, not the presence of non-biological components. In other words, mechanical components do not signal the turn to the post-human. Rather, she argues throughout her text, it is our shifting conception of subjectivity that really matters to how we become post-human. In short, she claims post-human subjectivity is defined by the following four tenets. One, a preference for informational patterns over material instantiation. 
two, uh, consciousness and the self are extended and displaced rather than discrete and localized. Third, the body is seen as merely a tool, the kind of original prosthesis that we learn to manipulate. And four, human life is organized such that it is seamless with intelligent machines. These are the four uh, components that make up the framework of posthumanism for Hales. We are posthuman because we see ourselves differently today than we did in ages past. We are no longer embodied creatures with monadic points of intention, but part of a network of displaced wills that gets lost in a sea of identity and power. We don't know where you end and where I begin. Now my argument here rests with taking issue with the, Hale, the way Hales often portrays posthumanism, specifically in, in this text, how we became posthuman. For Hales, the posthuman turn seems to be largely a cognitive shift in our beliefs about human subjectivity, even if I think uh, she might agree with me. But it's interesting to see the way that the terms themselves belie this kind of cognitive emphasis itself. So she uses terms like point of view to describe posthumanism, the assumptions of posthumanism, thinking, intellectual. However, my major contribution I want us to consider is what if the posthuman is not exhausted by or even primarily defined by cognitive categories at all? What if the posthuman comes about by other means entirely? Indeed, I think her slipping into such cognitive diction betrays her underlying argument that she says throughout the book, that we need to remember we are embodied creatures, not just mental thoughts floating in the ether. This is kind of her big criticism in the book. And because we aren't just mental states but embodied creatures, we need to pay attention to what difference being embodied makes to personhood. To do so, we need to focus on the movements of our bodies and how practice is an integral player to personhood, not just an extension of our cognitive faculties. It's constitutive of who we are, not just a mediating effect of our minds. Luckily, there is vast literature in sociology, philosophy, and indeed even theology the last 50 years that addresses precisely the difference practice makes to how we understand personal formation. Hence, this other part of my talk, formation. So let's briefly turn to this kind of sociological and philosophical literature before assessing how this redefinition might change how we perceive posthumanism and the church interacting. So let's look first at uh, uh, performative anthropology, the kind of sociological and philosophical sources. Um, Pierre Bourdieu is a 20th century French sociologist. Um, his contribution to what might be called a performative anthropology grew out of a dissatisfaction with modern sociology. Specifically, Bourdieu was worried that the objectifying demeanor of the social scientists eclipsed their ability to really get at the underlying motivations of people as social and performative beings. What needed to be recovered in sociology was the way that natives, i.e. those who are the object of social study, inhabited and moved in their unique social embodied and performative environments. In other words, the social scientist loses out on what it is like to be an individual from with inside the social field of action. What it is like to be the performer and the kind of pre or pan cognitive know-how that is concomitant with, parallel with, being a socially acting being. And Bourdieu recommended that the cure was deeper reflection on the way our practices and habits form us. This is in no way new, to be honest. The term that best encapsulates Bourdieu's thoughts is habitus. Habitus refers to our subjective dispositions that help us to construct our world see our world and live in our world in particular ways. These dispositions are often pre-reflective 
and enacted as embodied habits and traditions. Uh, one interpreter of Bourdieu, Carl Matten, has a wonderfully simple definition of Bourdieu's habitus. He says this, simply put, habitus focuses on our ways of acting, feeling, thinking, and being. It captures how we carry within us our history, how we bring this history into our present circumstances, and how we then make choices to act in certain ways and not in others. These histories that we embody through a habitus connect us to the rest of the social world. A habitus has been impressed on me through my relationships with other people and organizations. Hence, I am at home in the community that shares a common habitus, that orients my movements within it. However, I am not entirely defined by that group either. I also negotiate and make strategies within the structured group to navigate through its parameters and various cross pressures. I still maintain a level of volition. In this way, a habitus is more overarching than a kind of worldview with its echoes of an intellectualist focus because the habitus provides the possibilities, the disposition, and the parameters which underlie my explicit reflection of the world. Well, I, I could say much, much more about Bourdieu and others that support a kind of performative anthropology, but for the sake of time, I need to move on here. How does Bourdieu contribute to our discussion on posthumanism and the church? Well, I think he helps us to re relocate the interaction between posthumanism and the church. Instead of coming at this interaction with the bias of only seeing them as competing cognitive claims or belief systems, we need to attend to them even more. Instead of coming at this interaction with the bias of only seeing them as competing cognitive claims or belief systems, something can be gained by shifting the goalposts to include not just belief as the locus of interaction, but habits and practices as well. That's kind of my big, big thrust. So this is my thesis. What is at stake in the interaction between posthumanism and the church is not exhausted by a cognitive approach to either. In fact, because we often overlook how practices shape us cognitively and personally, we need to attend to them even more than the explicit intellectual beliefs that we hold. For we may actually find that we are engaged in what I call performative syncretism. We might engage unknowingly in all kinds of practices that reflect a kind of plurality of ideologies. In a sense, if we engage in performative syncretism, we are to use a kind of biblical imagery formed by different potters with different intentions and aims. Therefore, we need to recognize the practices as powerful, motivating crucibles of formation, rather than just passive and harmless extensions of prior cognitive belief. If and when we do so, we might find we are becoming post-human not via assent to its ideological tenets, but through its corresponding practices. Let's go to the next section, practice and formation in post-humanism. So this then invites the question, what are these practices that help us to form the post-human? Well, let's take Hells's four tenets of post-humanism as a kind of point of reference. First, the post-human condition is defined as a preference for informational patterns over material instantiation. What practices both elucidate and support a preference for informational patterns over material instantiation. Well, whenever I'm in public, I see people staring at their smartphones, and no one is talking to each other or even acknowledging one another. You might have similar experience as well. And when walking in parks, I see people with headphones on, prefer, you know, preferring their MP3s to the nascent sounds around them, chirping birds in the babbling brook. In public, we are surrounded by our personal bubbles of virtual informational networks and turn to them when in public. Furthermore, they are the way in which we experience and mediate the world. 
and highlight that we prefer these informational patterns to genuine materiality. Two pictures I've come across in the last few years profoundly manifest this post-human practice. The first picture came from uh, NBC several years ago, and it shows St. Peter's Square in Rome during the institution of Pope Benedict in 2005 on the top and Pope Francis in 2013. It's astounding that this practice of taking pictures with our smartphones in public has taken off in less than a decade. On such a momentous occasion, those faithful, I mean, imagine these are people probably going, right, for pilgrimage purposes. Those faithful in the crowd prefer to live the experience through their phones and tablets. It really does show how we experience the world through informational mediums rather than the primary material reality. The second picture is more abstract and is credited to one of my favorite street artists, artists Banksy. Maybe some of you have seen this. Here we see Banksy calling attention to our preference for virtual networks outside of just our public settings to some of our most intimate moments. It's a profound picture because it strikes to the heart of some of our most illuminating post-human practices today. Who here would deny taking their phones or iPad with them to bed, ignoring their spouse and loved ones in the process? I do it. Who has missed an important moment in the life of their child because they were too busy checking their Twitter feed? We engage in many practices today that help us to form the post-human preference for informational patterns over material instantiation. <coughs> well, the second tenet of post-humanism, you no doubt will remember, refers to consciousness and the self as extended and displaced rather than discrete and localized. What habits inculcate the extended and displaced self? Well, in ages past, material mementos, what anthropologist Alfred Gell calls idolata, acted as the means by which we are extended in the world. Of course, we still recognize the power and personal presence conveyed by something like an icon or a family heirloom. But today, this presence and extension of ourselves is much more sophisticated. Consider how seamlessly we extend our faculties and indeed even our presence through things like teleconference communications such as Skype, Zoom, and FaceTime. Frankly, my nieces and nephews would not know me as well as they do without Skype and FaceTime. They live in California, I live in Britain. I depend upon them to convey my image, my face, and perhaps even a bit of my presence to them. In a way, my personhood is somehow extruded through this virtual medium. And I simultaneously exist where I am embodied presently and in their living room. We find something similar in less real-time virtual activities like social media, creation of avatars, and other online persona. We convey ourselves to others through Facebook profiles, through Twitter feeds, and Instagram photos. What is interesting is that something like identity theft on the internet acknowledges the implicit connection between who we are, our identities, our personhood, with what extends beyond ourselves to our productions. So while an extended self is certainly not new in our information age, mementos, icons, etc., it is certainly much more robust and rampant. Now the third feature of posthumanism that Hales claims is the treatment of the body as the original prosthetic that we learn to manipulate. Associated activities and practices with this arm of posthumanism are items as rudimentary as just functional clothing or as sophisticated as brain hacking. For the former, clothing used to keep us warmer or shoes to enhance our running reflect this disposition of outfitting our bodies so that our nascent bodily abilities are improved. What is more, what is a smartphone but the prosthetic extension of our memory? The more extreme manipulation of our bodies through explicit bioengineering or brain hacking reveal in an even clearer way that we already engage 
in this third area of posthuman practice. Finally, recall that Hales defines the posthuman state as the seamless organization of human life with intelligent machines, AI. Here it is easy to see how our practices align with this tenet. How many of us have used Siri to schedule a meeting, to voice a reminder, or to call a friend? We may have even spoken to a bot on the phone to get our latest bank balance. What's important is how these intelligent machines have worked their way into our ordinary lives so that they are very much a part of our daily routines today, even when we don't see them as we've just heard from the past plenary talk. Think about what interacting with a computer was like some 50 to 60 years ago. Scientists and engineers were the only ones who used these intelligent machines, and they often took up an entire room and were crazy expensive. That all changed in the 90s with Bill Gates' vision to put a personal computer in every home. Now I can curl up with a cup of coffee and my tablet on the couch. This is the post-human story that we practice every day. Intelligent machines really are seamless with our human lives. So, if you have participated in any or all of these practices, I want to claim you have been aiding our transformation to the post-human state. Because our practices shape us, form us, and define us, they are not benign when it comes to enacting the post-human. We are well on our way to being post-human, not just through intellectual assent to its beliefs, but because we engage in its practices. What I've been intimating here about redefining the parameters for personhood and personal transformation around practices rather than beliefs is surely not new for the church. From the Desert Fathers to John Wesley, the focus on spiritual disciplines, ascetic practices, and personal holiness help us to conform to the image and likeness of God and Christ. And they have played substantial roles in showing us the grave importance that our practices make to who we are. Our performance is entirely relevant for our formation. Our performance is entirely relevant for our formation. What is more, in the last century, in particular, there has been a rip current developing amongst theologians and laity alike that acknowledges the importance of Christian practice to the faith and the way it forms who we are at the most fundamental level. Even in places that are purported to be the, the domain of just intellectual belief. For instance, let's take the Christian creeds. One might think that the recitation of the creeds is primarily about personal intellectual assent. It is about aligning our cognitive beliefs with these doctrines passed down to us. And while this is surely a certain uh, part of it, it being a communal element in just about every form of practice liturgy tells us something about its formative role as it is recited and performed in the context of worship. The cognitive elements in the creed cannot be separated from its place in practice and worship. <clears throat> Many of the Christian denominations express this important pairing when they claim in the off-sided phrase, lex arendi, lex credendi, which roughly translates as, the law of praying is the law of believing. As James K. Smith paraphrases in his book, Desiring the Kingdom, Worship, Worldview, and Cultural Formation, we pray before we believe, we worship before we know, or rather we worship in order to know. What Smith refers to here is the way that our worship in church has always been the bedrock of our beliefs. <clears throat> the development of doctrine in the first three centuries of the church grew precisely out of the worship and practices of the early Christians. To this day, if you ask a member of the Eastern Orthodox Church where their beliefs reside, they will point you to their worship and liturgy. They have no distinct location of their beliefs other than what they perform and practice in the church every Sabbath and every other day of the week. For the Christian, worship and belief are inseparable. 
But aside from acknowledging the way belief and practice are irrevocably entwined in the church, it's clear for many ecclesiological theorists that the church is the place where personal and communal formation occurs. Uh, the celebrated Eastern Orthodox theologian Alexander Schmemann puts it this way, the true spirit and meaning of liturgy, i.e. what the church does, is an all-embracing vision of life, including heaven and earth, time and eternity, spirit and matter, and as the power of that vision to transform lives. We anticipate the final consummation of the coming of the kingdom of God in the church and through the sacraments, the sacraments of communal worship are formed in coherence with Christ, who is the exemplar and end of this formation. The church as the body of Christ is the crucible of metanoia, the, the changing, the transformation of one's orientation, mind, spirit. Spoken of in the scriptures, where the entirety of ourselves, intellectual, moral, spiritual, affectional, is likewise transformed with Christ. The church is the animated and performed center of communal and personal transformation. And indeed, the Eucharist, I think, locates this transformative presence even more precisely. William Cavanaugh asserts in his groundbreaking text, Torture and Eucharist, that the church does not simply perform the Eucharist, the Eucharist performs the church. In many ways, he hearkens to an insight of Henri de Lubac as the basis of the early church's ecclesiology. Nourished by the body and blood of the Savior, his faithful people thus all drink of the one spirit who truly makes them into one single body. Literally speaking, therefore, the Eucharist makes the church, as de Lubac says. Well, in agreement with both Kavanaugh and de Lubac, I claim that the Eucharist, I think, can provide an important space and habitus, which I think at most runs counter to the kind of technological organization of post-human practices, or at least provides a kind of important corrective to it. Indeed, in the remaining time, I want to kind of explore precisely how the Eucharist performs the church and its individual members in contrast to the post-human technological organization of bodies. So let's look at the performed Eucharistic body. Great icon from Rublev. First, the Eucharist unites a gathered community in real space. Such gathering avoids the fragmentation and individualization that can occur because of virtual networks and the preference for informational patterns over material instantiation i.e. the first and second of the posthuman practices. As Schmemann notes, from the very beginning, the Eucharist was a manifestation and realization of the unity of the new people of God, gathered by Christ and in Christ. We need to be thoroughly aware that we come to the temple not for individual prayer, but to assemble together as the church. And the visible temple itself signifies and is but an image of the temple not made by hands. The Eucharist is characterized as a con celebration, a celebration with, where the laity serve as much in the action and gathering of the assembly as the clergy. In fact, the laity in the early church signified the presence of the assembly prior to the clergy entering the space of the liturgical action itself. Regrettably, the focal point of the Eucharist in the West has become the sacramental elements themselves, Schmemann says, and indeed the mystery that surrounds those elements. But Schmemann makes clear that the gathering of the community is and was originally prior to the action performed with the sacramental elements. As he points out, all evidence we possess points to the fact that the gathering or assembly was always considered the first and most basic act of the Eucharist itself. The Eucharist as a performance would not be possible without a whole church defined by its communal Eucharistic action. The Eucharist becomes the ecclesiological embodied action of those who gather and sup on the bread and the wine. 
These relations in the Eucharist Eucharistic community are not virtually enacted through created electronic means for the intended purpose of fulfilling just an agent's desire. Rather, what characterizes this gathered community is mutual submission to one another in an authentic relationship that are held together in real material space. Well, the imbibing of the wine and the conception of the bread does not magically entail forgiveness of sins, but it is an act of remembrance of the one who has forgiven sins and who calls us to right relationship with each other prior to partaking it. In these liturgical actions, one is made aware that a Eucharistic ecclesiology necessitates mutual submission one to another, which signifies both the importance of unity in the Eucharist and the requisite demeanor of its constitutive members. Furthermore, the Eucharistic community is conceived of in spatial performative action and in concrete liturgical movements. In this way, the Eucharist is a counter practice or a corrective to the disembodied and autonomous posthuman performance. The Eucharist also opposes the posthuman technological performance through privileging embodied offering, giving, and celebrating over against manipulation and control. This is um, uh, Hales's uh, point three above, that the body is our prosthetic, that which we learn to manipulate and control. Schmemann states this, bread and wine, by bringing these humble human gifts our earthly food and drink and place them on the altar, we perform, often without thinking it, the most ancient primordial rite that from the first day of human history constituted the core of every religion, we offer a sacrifice to God. Before one receives the sacramental elements for consumption, they are blessed and offered to God on the altar. As the quotation from Schmemann suggests, the Eucharist recalls the origin of its movement in the sacrificial cults of the Jewish people. Since the beginning of the Judeo-Christian religions, the sacrifice or offering has been central to its worship and practice. For in this Eucharistic recollection, one remembers Christ's final sacrifice for humanity's salvation. Likewise, one is to reflect this sacrificial demeanor towards others, even by laying down one's life. This imperative extends beyond the inwards constituents of just the, the church formed through the Eucharist. For as Kavanaugh also says, the church is most properly the church when it exists as gift and sustenance for others. Indeed, the Eucharist in the early church encapsulated the gifts of all the people which were meant to sustain those outside of the church, such as the poor, the widow, the orphans, in addition to just those in the physical church itself. In this way, the Eucharist is entirely defined by its sacrificial nature to those in and outside of the church. Rather than manipulating bodies for greater satisfaction, the Eucharist performs ecclesial bodies that celebrate communally. Indeed, Albert Borgman, uh, a celebrated philosopher of technology and uh, Catholic, has suggested a response to the technological situation in what he calls communities of celebration. As the phrase suggests, the very center, the fulcrum of the community centers on celebration. Such is the case with the Eucharistic community that celebrates redemption and life in the church. Schmemann even refers to the liturgical act as the very sacrament of joy. This joy and celebration of embodied participation in the church, even in suffering, is contrasted with the body, bodily manipulation of post-human practices. A particular incarnate relation typifies the Eucharistic body that affirms its embodied nature, its integrity, and its integration with the head of the church, that is Christ. One's body plays an active role in the Eucharistic action through the movement of the body in the liturgical rite. One is called from one's place amidst the laity and invited to move towards the altar to kneel and to consume. To consume Christ, the action is steeped in the very spatiality of our bodies. 
one's bodily person is called to participate and celebrate with amidst other bodies that do the same. But the key performative action of the Eucharist is the actual drinking of Christ's blood and the eating of his flesh. In this movement, his body becomes part of ours, and our body becomes part of his. And we are drawn into his incarnate body as the church when we celebrate the Eucharist. Our conformation to Christ is the embodied locus of the Eucharistic act. Indeed, just as the elements sustain the soul of the person, so also it is sustenance for the body. There is this parallel emphasis in lots of reflection upon the Eucharist between the bodily and physical notion of the person partaking as much as the spiritual and cognitive emphasis. This embodied component of the Eucharist was actually incredibly important for uh, William Cavanaugh's mm -hmm. overarching thesis in his book, Torture in Eucharist, which essentially said, look, uh, the problem with uh, the way that the Catholic Church um, was interpreting the Eucharist in Chile at the time um, as being this overly mystical interpretation of it lay at the heart of the Chilean church's refusal to acknowledge its role in stopping torture and violence under the Pinochet regime in the late 20th century. So this embodied component is absolutely central as a political move of resistance. The Chilean church had neither the doctrinal nor sacramental resources to resist, to resist the state's violence towards its members because it had abandoned the body as an important component of sacramental life. The Eucharistic performance of bodies reaffirms the integrity and materiality of bodies in communion with others and with God. The Eucharist, as a consummately Christian and embodied practice, highlights the poverty of the post-human instrumental body that is displaced and informational rather than material, integrous, and whole. All right, I'd like to conclude with, with two thoughts. First, if I'm right that a neglected meeting point between post-human and Christianity is to be found in how both contribute to personal formation via discrete practices, then it is insufficient for anyone to claim they can leave post-humanism alone because they do not agree to its ideology and its beliefs. For, as I have argued here, likely they are participating in those practices that contribute to the formation of the post-human. This has been my motivating purpose throughout this talk, to point out that what is at stake between post-humanism and the church cannot just be reduced to whether the claims of each converge, cohere, or diverge. Rather, we need to pay as much attention to their respective practices. And this leads to my second thought. I've argued here that the post-human performance of incarnate life seeks to habituate, one, a preference for informational patterns over material instantiation. Two, that the consciousness and self are extended and displaced rather than discrete and localized, that the body is merely a tool, the original prosthesis we learn to manipulate, and four, that human life is organized such that it's seamless with intelligent machines. On the other hand, the Christian performance of embodied life has Christ as template, and as we have seen with the Eucharist, provides a kind of counterpractice, or maybe even a corrective, to the detrimental performance of post-human existence. Christian embodiment in the Eucharist focuses on the communal life marked by offering, by sacrifice, by celebration. Ecclesial practices such as the Eucharist affirm the integrity of our incarnate life as we are drawn into the broken yet glorious body of Christ who makes all things new. Indeed, Christ performs his church to be an incarnate witness to others who bears the very mark of his own image. At the end of all things, when Christ is all in all, we are invited into that great performance, the Holy Trinity, which is the very wellspring of all existence and out of which all is performed. Thank you.
Michael, thank you so much for um, taking us deeper into post-humanism and opening up in a very clear way um, that I began to understand it a little bit more. We have about half an hour for questions. Please wait till you have the microphone and stand up as well when you deliver your question. So, who would like to kick off? Christopher. Thank you very much, Michael. Most interesting and lots to feed on. Thank you. Um, I just wondered whether you felt, in the light of what you'd said, that uh, whether there's any potential for virtual church, the church um, embodied in silico, if you like. Mm -hmm. I think one can absolutely have, I mean, um, all relationships are mediated. But I, I always feel, at least with the current virtual networks we have, they almost always are not as robust as in-person bodily communication and relationships. I mean, how many times have I just written a quick email to somebody and they have interpreted it as being curt and potentially cold? If I had said those exact same things to that person before them, they'd have all kinds of other cues to show you know, the timbre of my voice looking at them in the eye. So it's not to say that you can't um, approach, I think, that kind of interaction or that it's possible. And it seems to me that it's, it's especially for those who that it's difficult, I think, to physically attend, um, then it becomes something which is, it's better than not having it, it seems to me. But, um, uh, dare I mention Brexit, but um, I mean, many of you I'm sure have heard of these Skype families because of certain immigration policies around the world where um, a mother might not be able to uh, be in the country, but a father and a child might. So in that situation, one physically can't be with one's own family, but in the same kind of way I can't be with my nieces and nephews on a consistent basis. But I think it's precisely when it starts to eclipse, remove, take us away from those more robust um, interactions, then, then something is, is starting to, to go awry. And I think part of what I was trying to say is, why do we prefer those kinds of mediated relationships? Is it because they're messy? Is it because really I care about what I want? And, and I think that's more of what I'm more concerned about, is them eclipsing it. Thank you for that. Um, uh, so I, I've, I've read a, a fair amount of Jamie K. Smith, so I was, it, when you mentioned him, I was like, yes, I thought I could hear you talking <laughs> in those terms. Yeah. As, I, as I understand him, uh, the job of habits is to form our loves. Yeah. And, and so he says, you are what you, what you love. Absolutely. And so hence the title of the book, Desiring the Kingdom. Yeah. So with your thesis that mm. post-humanism is not just a set of ideas, but a set of habits, what are those habits forming us to love? Mm. The, the, po the, the church post, or the post-human post ones? habits, how are they, for what loves are mm. they forming in us? Um, that's a very good question. Um, uh, Gerald McKinney has a great article called Technologies of Desire, for that, which essentially attends, I think, to a lot of, of, of what you're talking about. Um, that what, 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 and and it, it certainly goes to this idea that how we interact with each other and with certain technologies um, is operated in some ways by the desires that oftentimes those tech companies, the norms that we kind of create in our own um, social worlds, right? You know, so uh, for instance, every time um, you see people lining up at the Apple store to get the latest iPhone, what is it they're desiring? Do they desire that phone or do they desire a particular kind of transcendence that Apple is saying, this is really what you're buying. 
And so much of advertising today isn't about, hey, look at this wonderful new phone that has all these gadgets. No, it's the kind of person that you can be. And so, I mean, techno-capitalism, I think, in order to really understand technology today, you need to understand tech companies um, and the way that that often gets sold as part of the technological culture, it seems to me. So absolutely, they deal in desire. Um, and they deal in who you ought to be. Um, in fact, I remember being, this was four or five years ago, uh, back in California, the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, watching, it must have been American football or something, and on came this uh, um, advertisement for Gatorade or some sport drink. And the football players were cyborgs and they were kind of running. And, and it, was, it, it was just, there was so much food for thought in terms of what was being sold there. Not just in terms of, I think, the actual product, but even the way that some just consumptive things are starting to turn to using more techno babble, right? A sport drink uses the kind of language of enhancement and you know, electricity in your veins and things like this. Um, it, it's, it's the symbols that we use as, as well today. So yeah, I think that there's a lot to be said there. This is, this is perhaps more of a, a practical question from the perspective of a minister. Yeah. Uh, I, I belong to a tradition which has much less mm. uh, focus on Eucharist than, mm. than traditions you've been using as examples. But we do have a strong tradition on gathering Absolutely. as a definition of the church. <coughs> and um, I've been, had the privilege this year to, to visit maybe 50 of our churches up and down the country. Mm. And one of the things I'm noticing is that we gather less. Uh -huh. Uh, when I ask a church, how, how big are you? They say, well, you know, we're this size, but actually on a Sunday, mm. we're a lot smaller than that because people don't come. Mm. Maybe come once a month, twice a month. Mm. So, uh, there is a, a tendency in that environment to try and use things like social media and technology yeah. to connect people together to keep them in touch. Mm. And I think that's quite a strong emphasis in trying to attract millennials and yeah. Generation Z who are describes as tech native but from yeah. what you have said tonight actually that just undermines <laughs> this sense of gathering so d could you comment on that and how how this uh, how your thesis in a sense uh, speaks to our mission so to I, a present society yeah that, 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 that's a really good question um, I, I mean that's that's difficult and I think in some ways it's because uh, it's very connected to the response that I gave to, to Chris here which is uh, I, I'm not saying that it automatically breaks down community. But it is in virtue of the fact that it's, all interactions are mediated. Um, what, um, what is lost in that interaction? And what is gained in it? Um, there's, there's a certain sense of intimacy, right? When you're texting somebody alone, which actually is sometimes really difficult to have that intimacy if you're having kind of long form kind of chatting um, with, with someone who's, who's there in person. So sometimes that mediation, or, or maybe you know, something which is a, bit, a, a thicker mediation, actually helps you to be more vulnerable. In which case, I could see that as being potentially useful in certain circumstances. Um, I don't know if anybody has uh, seen this statistic with you know, millennials and you know, uh, kids under the age of 18, but they're all essentially cleaner, you know, more straight-laced than all of us, um, and one of the reasons why a lot of people are saying is it's because why should we go out? <laughs> I, can, I can stay in my room and have the kind of interaction I want. Or even if we do go out, I mean, th th there's a Chinese restaurant in Oxford I always love going to, and I go in there, and you have tons of people that are gathered around a table. Nobody's looking at each other. Instead, they're typing to other people. So even though, so you can have terrible interactions while communing. Right? It's more difficult. It's more difficult than all that. Yeah. Uh, what you're talking about made me think about a number of things. Uh, one was um, it, certainly within the Anglican Church, the increased number of multi church benefices, where basically the, the priest often just turns up for the 
communion part of it and then mm. disappears without any interaction with the congregation because mm. you're going on to the next one. Mm. And it seemed to me that's a real problem. Mm. Uh, it made me think about the place of the peace mm. because you talked about the movement to the communion right yeah. now. Um, there's also the movement towards each other in the yeah. peace. And I know lots of people don't like the peace, but it seems to me that it's, it's actually doing something very important, as even does the gathering for tea and coffee after, yeah, yeah, yeah. at the end, all those physical interactions. Right. And the last one, it made me Sacrament think Sacrament of, of tea and coffee. Yeah, the last thing it made me think of was the use of the body in worship. Yeah. Because uh, you were saying about the, the, the manipulate, it, the, the, so involving the body yeah. in worship seems to me to be an important part of that. Yeah. Uh, of our worship as well. Yeah. That's great. Now feel free to have comments, things like that as well. That's wonderful. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. Really um, thought-provoking material, particularly the, the characterization you, you drew from of um, post-humanism, the, the four points. Um, so I, I had two questions mm. coming off that. First of all, um, if you'd used a different characterization, would, I mean, would you have found other elements in the Christian tradition to resonate with, or are they less fertile? Um, I mean, I can see why that one in particular draws itself to a kind of a Eucharistic, Semitic yeah. kind of representation. And the second thing is the question about number two, mm. about the self being yeah. extended. And it strikes me that this is something that isn't new at all. Because you, you simply need to go back to Paul's letters to his various congregations to see an ancient text, someone talking about his own presence being communicated through text, and which we still find resonances with 2,000 years later. So I wondered if some of these mm. issues are really mm. actually not necessarily so very new. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's exactly right. Um, I mean, I, th I think I even said that in... Uh, in relation to the conscious and self are extended, looking at icons, looking at mementos, things like this, that really convey, you know, uh, the presence of, of others going back. I mean, I mean, even, even in the ancient Near East, you know, kings putting, you know, big statues of themselves up in the far, you know, remote reaches of their kingdom they, that they might not never get to, but it literally conveyed their presence and their authority there. Absolutely. This, this is not new. What's interesting, though, is the way that it becomes the way that we actually live our lives. So it's not something which is, is ancillary, I think, to what we're doing, but we live our lives through them, through the personas that we create for ourselves on social media, right? Um, the way that I think that it's happening more and more. And your, your, your first question was interesting. So you're saying, um, had I chosen other kinds of uh, particular practices, might I have found other Christian uh, notable elements to, that would somehow respond to them? Yeah, I mean, that, that would take time for me to think about what those other th things of the post-human might be. Um, I mean, um, one of them might be some kind of relation to the, the human itself, like a dissatisfaction with the human, um, which I think would be really, really interesting to look at. In fact, in fact um, so I have this, this big project um, with about 15 to 16 theologians, philosophers, and others called Christian Flourishing in a Technological Age. And one of the things that um, we're really looking at is how much this dissatisfaction with the human or the, the, the breaking of the human or something is um, something that Christians just can't get on board with, <laughs> essentially, because it's precisely through becoming fully human, fully human in Christ, that we can actually reach transcendence. Whereas the post-human understanding of transcendence is, I can never be fulfilled or transcend myself in the current state of humanity. Therefore, I have to leave it. Whereas the, the Christian account of transcendence and deification is, um, um, essentially, it's precisely in becoming fully human in Christ. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. My, my question is this. If, from what I understood, from what you said, 
if the Eucharist or the church is somehow a corrective to post-humanism, yeah. then how then should we market or promote the church oh. in this day and age? Yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, the nice thing about human beings is the litmus test of feeling fulfilled. Um, part of, at least part of the, you know, going green, you know, um, going out and leaving urbanization, you know, to, to go on vacation, right, to unwind, um, to, uh, I mean, people might even use the term recharge one's batteries, which in some ways betrays precisely, you know, the, um, the very image itself. But this idea that people, I think, are, are, are feeling more drained, disconnected, and that, that they understand that. If I think we can present, um, I think, a very winsome, and, and this has been at the heart of the Christian message for, well, since the beginning. Um, we want you to have a good life. And I think we can help a little bit with that. And I think, I think that speaks to a lot of people. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. Thank you for a really interesting talk. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about the intentional formation in practice uh, in relation to God forming us um, yeah. in Christian practices, but also yeah. outside of Christian practices. Interesting. And especially in relation to like the, how does the desired enhancement mm. relate to God's formation for us yeah. and um, God using us in our weakness yeah, yeah, yeah. specifically? Um, what I hear potentially in that question is, can human enhancements ever be a form of, or, or a way in which God forms us? Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think it could be. I think it could be. Um, and so part of what I almost always, uh, so I don't think um, under the influence or command or force of a post-human ideology, but do I think a particular human enhancement um, could potentially be used for the good of a particular person, then yes, uh, I, I think so. Um, but a lot would be uh, come down to the why that person would want to get that um, in the first place. Uh, it, 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 there'd have to be a lot of deep plumbing of what their motivations are, I think, is, is part of it. Um, my sense is that, so there's this group called the Christian Transhumanist Association, um, is certainly arguing for, for precisely that. What I think they don't understand is the way that these human enhancements, well, so much of the way that they are defined, sold, et cetera, is it's hard to separate that out from the underlying kind of ideology of, of a kind of transhumanist, post-human account. But do I think it can't be? Maybe it could. The woman at the back, and then we'll do it. Thank you very much for a really engaging paper. Um, I was just wondering off the back of what you were saying about some of the extension and displacement of consciousness and self being in some ways a dissatisfaction with human and therefore yeah. trying to be post-human. Um, is there also something in there about um, the rejection of creatureliness? and therefore playing into the, the comment that came from over here about the, the, the desires that this might be helping us to answer. Yeah. Is it something about rejecting the idea of being um, limited and temporal? So that in, with, with artificial intelligence and with even just things like Twitter, say I can be in more than one place at once, as you were saying with you, your nieces. Yeah. So I can be um, omnipresent yeah. and the stuff that I put out there lives on beyond me, so somehow I can be eternal. Yeah. So is it something about the rejection of creatureliness as mm. well? Yeah. No, um, I, I literally just had a, a project called Deification and Creaturehood in an age of bio-enhancement that 
Robert Song and some others were kind of involved with. And part of it, I think, was because a, a lot of some of the typical Christian responses in the last 15, 20 years have been precisely, look, we're creatures. And that in really attending to what it means to be a creature, limited, fragile, vulnerable, um, embedded in community with other kinds of creatures, um, we, um, we learn to, um, well, to how to care, I think, for those other creatures um, in a way. Um, but also, it's, it's somehow more appropriate to who we are. Um, but it seems to me that's abs that that's only part, I think, of, of the issue. Part of what I want to affirm with, I think, the post-human drive as well as like, but it's also our creativity. It's our wanting to strike out, to not be satisfied with the present. Also, that makes us unique, creative, whether it's through, you know, creating poetry, you know, that... Um, talks about you know, the, the, the heights of the kind of glory and creation you know, on the wing of a kingfisher or something. Um, so I wouldn't want to say like, oh, we should just be happy with our limitations. But I think it's precisely what we have to acknowledge the goodness that comes from our creaturely life being limited, i.e. what God creates is good. Um, but also the way in which we reach transcendence is not through the rejection of the human, but precisely in the valorization and the glorification um, that we receive in laying down our life um, in, uh, um, in Christ. So it's the means, I think, of that attainment and the way that we understand our, our, our creaturely existence. You know. So we have David here. Yeah, thanks for providing much food for thought. Yeah. Um, what do you think <coughs> the future of AI developments, uh -huh. what effect will they have on post-humanism? Uh, well, they like it. I mean, um, it's... Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I imagine... Um, uh, so, so one particular variant of post-humanism post -humanism referred to as transhumanism, so we heard from Ray Kurzweil um, earlier, who's one of the most notable transhumanists, wants to say that we reach a transhuman state precisely by us melding with superintelligent machines. That we reach this thing called the singularity, which um, is a kind of tear in the fabric of history because from one moment to the next will be so um, fast, s change so quickly because intelligent, super intelligent machines move so quickly that um, uh, we won't be able to discern from our present capabilities those kinds of changes um, from kind of one step to another. So uh, um, transhumanists say, uh, that it's, that it's precisely our integration with artificial intelligence, um, artificial intelligence and, and super intelligence, which will mean, in fact, it's the primary um, driver to us becoming transhuman. What the? Um, uh, that, I mean, um, th th I, I, I can't speculate on that. I, 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 I don't know. We'll, we'll have to chat a bit more about that. So next question here. If it happens. Uh, what I have in my hand is an apple. <laughs> and isn't there an analogy between this and the garden? <laughs> in that what we are seeking is ourselves. Yeah. And, and actually, mm. it's a bit like the photographs of uh, the Pope, you know, and the, yeah. po the other Pope. Um, yeah, we've moved from actually experiencing life to, to fearing mm. the experience of life in which we capture it mm. rather than experience. Yeah. So the underlying issue I think I'm trying to point to is it's like in that story, mm. the eating of the apple is, is a bit like trying to go beyond yourself. Yeah. And so this is, is kind of like a, a symptom of that trying to reclaim something of yourself in a world that you are mm. 
not actually in control of. Mm. So at the root of all that is this mm. kind of existential fear of experience yeah. and of the world. Yeah. Um, I'm not yeah. sure that was a question, actually. No, 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 no. But what, 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 I, what I find interesting is, is the way that, that fleeing from mm. that experience of the world will mean we'll never be happy. Because yeah. it doesn't, because we won't actually understand the conditions of our actual existence by creating these simulacra, yeah. right? So we kind of evade those those existential questions, which make us realize we are creatures, we are in need, we it's are are vulnerable. Are. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or it has the possibility of doing that. Yeah. It's certainly a, a particular way of using it that we have become inculcated in. This gentleman at the back and this lady here next. Uh, thank you so much uh, yeah. for your lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent you think Hale's uh, definition of post-humanity is a matter of uh, perspective. It's exciting. It's now because we've yeah. just reached that point. Mm -hmm. um, because I look at number three, the body is merely a tool, the original <laughs> prosthesis we learn to manipulate. Yeah. I mean, that sounds quite a lot like Plato, yeah. which is not that new. Yeah. Um, or even human life is organized uh, that it's seamless with intelligent machines. Mm. And AI is repeatedly redefined depending mm. on what is now intelligent. You know, OCR, the, the, the text recognition, that used to be AI and now it's just, it's just tech. It's, just, it's, it's, not, it's not intelligent, it's just, it's just what machines do. So I'm just wondering to what extent this post-human is, um, uh, is uh, simply, you know, we feel like we're on the cusp because this technology is new and exciting. Mm. Um, but this written about 20 years ago or 100 years ago, the loom, suddenly that's intelligent machine. Yeah. yeah. So, so in other words, the way that that newness is kind of sold in, in kind of technology is, is, um, is, is so much, is, is kind of important to the culture that's developed around it. Yeah. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, it reminds me, um, Especially the way that uh, um, you know devices now are created with you know shorter lifespans, you know created obsolescence, because because the idea is that we uh, and, and not only that but like you know this is part and parcel of Ray Kurzweil's you know exponential growth of technology, you know which actually will mean we'll get to the singularity in 2045, you know it's it's that it's new it's great it's wonderful it's slick. And, w and it, it, it has possibilities. Doesn't that empower you? Uh, sorry, so the follow-up then is, yeah. were, uh, is, were the Victorians then post-human mm. for what they developed, or you know, the Romans Question. or the Greeks, or you know, to what extent is this yeah. a real significant now moment, yeah. and to what extent is this just us excited because this is, our, this is the new thing? Yeah, yeah, so, so um, you have other theorists who say we've never been human, we've only ever been post-human. Um, particularly because if, if, if the human is like this biologically sealed, um, never, has never um, created artifacts, then you're never going to find that human being. Because we've always had, not, not just relationships with our own artifacts, but we are somehow, um, there's a certain amount of mutuality in our development. Um, there is a really important new movement called the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis that really kind of considers at the most basic level how the kind of, um, the kind of symbiotic development of uh, who we are um, can only be known in our relation to our productions, our culture. It's not just that our evolutionary history is driven by you know, variation in our genes, but even the way our variation and selection happens is a product more and more we're finding of our environment, our built environment, our artifacts, our culture, and how we develop. So you'll, maybe you'll never find the human in that, in that respect. Yeah. Lady here. My, my question, or my thoughts are really in how we use the technology. I was um, meeting with local ministers recently and the Roman Catholic priest said, I do 50 house communions each mm. week and I wow. have 20 in my congregation. I'm trying to work out how to include them mm. 
mm. in the the weeklies or the, the daily celebrations um, so that they actually feel part of the community yeah. of, of that gather for worship yeah. um, and and that is sort of linked with something I think the Facebook founder talked about a while ago about his mission to go beyond what Facebook has become mm. to go back to creating face-to-face -face yeah. communities yeah. and how that's actually um, produced uh, Facebook, I don't know quite, quite what they're called, but, but there's a, a running group for mums. Yeah. Um, and certainly in the place where I work, um, the local neighbourhood politics has yeah. been reinvigorated by, by local conversation groups. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's very true. Um, I think in response to your, your first kind of query, I mean, in, in one sense, right, this um, uh, Catholic priest who has to give, you know, um, um, <clears throat> the Eucharist 50 times a week in some way, and is worried about how do I bring these people together communally. I mean, it's, it's the same bread and wine that's used from the Sunday, right? And isn't that, that's kind of part of the point, is that in bringing it to you, it signifies that we're still part of a community. What's interesting is, does that show us something about us being extended over time and space? But using almost those, sacrament, those sacraments as the means by which, yes, you're still a part of it, you know, um, making those visits. But it says the priest comes to do it, you know, as the representative and the, and the example, the, the symbol of that community. But, but, but certainly that you know, doesn't seem as fruitful, right, as an entire group, you know, who's, who's there together in that kind of local congregation. It's really interesting you say that social media is, is being used in some ways as reinvigorating kind of um, locality with kind of certain kind of Facebook groups. And what's interesting there is a lot of, maybe, maybe some of that is because people aren't actually seeing each other in person. So instead they have to create the space online to actually have those interactions. Like for instance, I live in some townhouses, and I very rarely have you know, much interaction with the people that are right next to me. But I might text them you know, because I want, you know, need something. Or there might be you know, some Facebook or email listserv that can, you know, kind of does it. Whereas maybe 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, you're chatting over the fence you know, about this, or having you know, community block parties and, th and, that's, and that's how that, or having people in your home, right? That's, that's good. Thank you. Uh, some people, I think Keith Ward's one of them, has commented how the language and, lit and image of liturgy was concurrent with the age of the time, and that uh, technology and society has moved on so much that we no longer do that. So the question is, is there any language and image that we should be using in liturgy which will connect with these post-human peoples that we are ah, surrounded by? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was just at the Faraday Institute two weeks ago and uh, on precisely this topic of AI and religion. And one of the big things was how you get this kind of conversation you know, happening in, in, in churches. Um, and it seemed to me, uh, one of the things I said was, look, there are lots of Christians that are in the tech industry. Um, but very rarely in, you know, from pulpits are we saying that one's vocation, particularly as someone who's a technologist, has kingdom value. Or at least that vocation, whereas it's much easier to talk about you know, the helping industries. You know, if you're a medical doctor, if you're a nurse, you know, in some senses, we've, we valorize you because there's this longer history and tradition of, of having that kind of connection. You know, I mean, famously, right, you know, Methodism sprung up as these kind of, you know, places where, you know, you could get, you know, some mild, um, uh, you know, health concerns kind of dealt with, et cetera, et cetera, in the churches. And it seemed to me that, you know, um, uh, we, we have certain things that could be developed in the liturgy. Um, that might be useful. For instance, um, on those Sundays uh, where 
uh, we have the Harvest Festival. Instead of going out to your local Tesco and buying baked beans, which probably has no connection or very little connection to one's own vacation, right, or even one's first fruits, as one might have had in an agrarian society, if you work on smartphone cameras, why don't you bring in your smartphone camera as your first fruit that gets put on the collection plate, offered up as part of the season? So it seems to me that there are, are ways that utilize existing liturgy that are, is much more meaningful. It connects to our vocations and kind of what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's maybe one kind of example or something like that. Uh, so final question, Hannah here at the front. I'm really sorry, I know more, more hands have been going up, but um, we're booked to go to the pot bar at half past. No. So one final question, I know Michael's hanging around. I'll try and make it a good one. Um, as a, as a token millennial in the room, uh, let me reassure all of you that um, online relationships are painfully real yeah. um, <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, in light of that, something that I was wondering whether fit into your model of post-humanism or perhaps fits into one of these categories mm. um, that's very much shaping of the way we experience the world is that of surveillance yeah. um, and in particular the way that social media creates the ability to surveil each other as much as machines surveil us. Um, and if you could comment on the way that shapes our understanding of accountability and also forgiveness. Yeah. Accountability and forgiveness, absolutely. There was a, um, um, there was a research project, uh, well, maybe it was just a conference in Oxford about four or five years ago about forgetting and how important you know, that might or might not be to something like reconciliation. Um, and there was a, a couple of um, papers on w we don't forget now, especially in the age of the internet where anything uh, can be found out, if not relatively soon or, or very, very quickly. Um, so that, that, that certainly seems to be um, a huge part of, they're just, you know, server farms and server farms of just information, right, that, that's just there. And, you know, with decent hacking skills, you could probably gain, you know, access to that pretty, pretty easily. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's lots of things that could be said um, about that. About, and then, and especially about, yeah, the kind of surveillance society that we live in, which isn't the kind of big brother watching you, but it could be, you know, anybody, you know, so, um, how many of you probably Googled each of the speakers that's going to be here so that, you know, before we started talking, if not right, right now, to find out a little something about us? Maybe you went on to Facebook to find out my recent posts. You know, th this is, um, and sometimes that can completely limit, you know, your interaction with that person, right? You know, maybe when you're on a dating app and you're like, well, this is what they portrayed. What can I find online in an hour? Psh, that's not going to happen. It's the reality of, of where we are. Um, I chose not to put my two-year-old daughter on social media, um, but other people take pictures of her and things like this because by the time she's going to be 18, she's going to have an entire life, which she has had very little uh, life, right? I'm saying life, and, but it's like, you know, if you would have told somebody 15 to 20 years ago, life is the kind of thing that happens online, but like that, is com that, that can really be dictating of a person's life, you know? Um, I think of someone like you know, Walter Palmer, the, the dentist who shot the lion or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I mean, one's life can be entirely ruined by just, you know, someone or people turning against you, you know? So that, that surveillance is absolutely real. Or you take something like, you know, um, China's social credit system. You know, which is essentially going to be so much easier in an age of information technology. So as they kind of rank you, how well you're doing, you know, um, as a good citizen, you know, of um, the Chinese state, how is that going to be used to, to, uh, to engineer behavior? And then it starts to look like a very different Orwellian kind of um, state itself. 
Michael, thank you so much. We're all, we're all mm -hmm. going to go and Google you now, just to find out <laughs> what else we can find out about you. Thank you so much for a wonderful Gowan lecture, for the input, but also taking all the questions and, and bringing us into your room, bringing us up to speed with how what you've said interacts with our own lives, wherever mm -hmm. we're coming from. So please join me in thanking Michael once again for his lecture. <laughs>